Hello guys and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be forming the tetrazine ring and doing a few other reactions with it. As always I would love to give a special thank you to my Temple Star patrons due to their large donation. So thank you very much. On a final note I would like to talk about the channel. To put it simply, this will be the last video for a while. I've been doing this chemistry YouTube thing for around two years and it's been great but I just don't feel the same about it anymore. I'm not quitting chemistry, but I am taking a break because it's just, I have a lot on my plate right now and I can't really fit it all in. Along with that, I also don't really have the passion for making videos on it anymore, as it's just a lengthy process. Sorry to dump this on you guys right at the beginning of the video, but I feel like more people will hear it if it's here versus the end, so sorry about that. I didn't want to disappear, making you guys think that I might have had an accident or something. Anyways, let's get to the video. So first things first, I'm going to be synthesizing the actual tetrazine ring. For this synthesis, I followed a paper made in 1991. This paper was awesome because it outlined everything that I needed to know to make this dimethylpyrazole tetrazine. All I needed to do was add triaminoguanidine hydrochloride, or triaminoguanidine nitrate, to acetylacetone in a 1 to 2 molar ratio respectively. The paper did say that triaminoguanidine hydrochloride yields higher, but uh, I only had triaminoguanidine nitrate on hand at the time. So from the information I gathered in the paper, I made a slurry of triaminoguanidine nitrate and added the acetyl acetone to it dropwise while making sure that it stays at room temperature. I ended up not having any problems with heat, but right as the acetyl acetone was done adding, the solution turned a very nice neon yellow. From here the paper said to leave it stirring at room temperature for half an hour, so that's what I did. And I watched it the entire time and I noticed that it seemed to have a bunch of different stages. The first stage was obviously it turning a very neon yellow. From there the triaminoguanidine seemed to not really dissolve into the solution, but it became a really really fine precipitate. Very soon after this happened, you can actually see it on video right here. It all dissolved into solution and it became a clear neon yellow. At the end of the 30 minutes, uh, some of the product crashed out, but obviously it's not in very high yield. So from here, we're going to heat it at 70 Celsius in a hot water bath for four hours. This should drive the reaction forward and give us the decent yield that the paper said it, uh, this reaction had. After a fair bit of heating, you can see that the volume increased drastically from the marker that I put on the flask. And you can also see that it's a much lighter yellow color, which is good. We want that tanner color. Here is what our final product looked like after the four hours of heating. It got a little bit red, but that's okay because the paper said that would happen. From here we just filter the reaction mix, and uh, as you can see we get our tan colored product. So you may be asking, you're claiming that this is the product, but how do you actually know? And the answer is, I really don't. Thank you guys so much for watching the video, I hope you guys enjoyed. No, but in all seriousness, I confirmed my product by setting up a scuffed melting point apparatus. All I had to do was make a little, somewhat, like a capillary tube, out of a test tube. Then from there I would suspend it over mineral oil, which would be heated up on my oldest piece of chemistry apparatus, the good old hot plate. From here I have to manually stir it, but oh well, I should get a pretty accurate reading. Besides the slight hiccup of my uh, stir rod bubbling profusely, um, I actually got a fairly accurate reading, and it confirmed my beliefs that we do have the product. The melting point that they got in the paper was 150 degrees Celsius, and the melting point that I got was between 150 and 153 degrees Celsius. Since it only melted a couple degrees above the theoretical melting point, and considering the apparatus I had, I think that I can confirm that this is a, a decent purity of uh, the product that I was looking for. Now that I know the smaller scale reaction works, I can scale it up to a uh, decent extent. After running the scaled up reactions, I was finally ready to move on to the next compound that I was going to make. This next compound is called dihydrazinotetrazine. Now, this tetrazine molecule is a little bit different than our last one for two reasons. First one, the uh, dimethylpyrazoles are replaced with hydrazino groups. And the second reason is that it's not the dihydrotetrazole. The second reason is really important because the compound that we just synthesized 
is the dihydrotetrazole form of the tetrazine ring. This really concerned me at first because I had to buy NMP, which is a solvent that's quite expensive for me to get, and I had to run a whole other reaction, which the paper says yields in 99%, but I doubt I'd get that, and I'd have to deal with a bunch of oxidizers, so I didn't really want to do that. However, luckily, I found another paper provided by America's one and only Los Alamos that outlines a one-pot reaction where I just add hydrazine to acetonitrile and it oxidizes it during the reaction. So you don't have to do a separate reaction for it. So now that we know what we are going to do, let's do the reaction. So here you can see I put the dimethylpyrazole dihydrotetrazine into the uh, acetonitrile. Now it doesn't dissolve, but it does form a uh, suspension, a very thick suspension. At first I thought this would be a problem because I thought it was supposed to dissolve, but it ended up not being an issue, so it's okay. I then just added in the hydrazine hydrate. I used a 40% hydrazine hydrate solution, so it wasn't that concentrated. Now for this reaction to properly occur, I needed it exposed to the air, so I'm going to remove the stopper and I put a balloon filled with oxygen up to it in an attempt to um, make the reaction have a little higher yield. Now the paper just used an open beaker, but the reason I didn't do that is because acetonitrile is fairly volatile, so I didn't really want it evaporating away since I don't have access to that much. So in turn, I just put it in a flask and I put a balloon with concentrated oxygen over the flask, which should have the same effect because it is applying a positive pressure into it. So hopefully the oxygen was forced into the solution at least somewhat. This is what the solution looks like four hours later out of the 48 hours that it needs to uh, stir and you can see that it's already turning red and the solution is much less viscous so it looks like it actually started to dissolve into the solution overall the synthesis was pretty easy and went without a hitch i just kept having to refill the balloon every once in a while with oxygen to make sure it was topped off this is what it looked like when the reaction was over and now i was ready to filter it this is what the dry filtered product looks like I even got a picture of it under microscope. The whole reason of making this compound is because this compound is the gateway to all the other energetics that I want to make from tetrazine. We have covered quite a bit so far in this video, so I'm going to draw it out. So here it is drawn out. We can see we first made product 1 at the beginning of this video, and then we made product 2 after that, which was the dihydrazino tetrazine. And from the dihydrazino tetrazine, you can see the three pathways that we're going to go. First, I'm going to go over the bottom pathway. That compound is dichlorotetrazine. The paper talks about how good of an electrophile it is. It's so good, in fact, that it can react with 5-aminotetrazole and form this monstrosity. So to make the dichlorotetrazine, all I did was dissolve the dihydrazino tetrazine in some acetonitrile. From there, I'm just going to pass dry chlorine through the solution and uh, we should see a color change from red to orange. Here's what it looked like right as I started bubbling chlorine through it, and you can see some excess gas being generated. That's good because this reaction actually produces nitrogen as a byproduct. As the reaction went on, it got really hot, which is scary because we're going through a diazonium intermediate, so I put it in an ice bath, and as you can see, it's already starting to turn really orange. This is what the reaction looked like when it was over, and I just let it heat back up to room temperature. You can see the plentiful bubbles of supposedly nitrogen, so that's a good sign. From here, I was just supposed to vacuum distill out the acetonitrile, leaving the chloro compound behind. However, it didn't exactly go that way. The acetonitrile really wanted to stick around and refused to leave the um, chloro compound without bringing it over through the uh, vacuum pump. I ended up transferring the distillation through another more robust vacuum pump that is significantly cheaper, but I still think that it got absolutely fucked up by these chlorine vapors and compound that were just going through it. So even if the reaction by itself didn't fail, I was not able to separate the final compound from the mother liquor. So what a fun waste of time. At least this reaction reminded me about how much I hate working with halogens, especially chlorine. Now that I've done with this compound, let's move to the one above it. I'm just going to start off by saying that this reaction is significantly easier, and it also made it easier that I previously titrated this nitric acid and found its exact concentration, so this one was fun. 
All I had to do was react the dihydrazinotetrazine with a 2 molar equivalent of nitric acid. The dihydrazinotetrazine also acted very nicely because although it's sparingly soluble in water, it's very soluble in acidic solutions. After letting it stir for 30 minutes, I poured it into a crystallizing dish and let it dry over a period of two days. Here's what it looks like when fully dried. Here's a direct flame test. Okay, so here's the nitrate. Pretty good burn. Indirect flame just yielded smoke. That's all there is for this compound. I couldn't get it to detonate from shock or friction and the can test didn't yield anything either. Now it's time for us to go to our third and final compound. This one should also be the coolest. For this synthesis, I first had to make some 3 molar hydrochloric acid from the store-bought muriatic acid. I then added the dihydrozenotetrazine into the acidic solution. As you can see, it dissolves very well. Now I'm going to cool the solution down to around 0 degrees Celsius. It's really important for this step that I do not let it rise above 3 degrees Celsius. Now that it's at the temperature, we're going to start adding a sodium nitrite solution very slowly. Once I'm done adding all the sodium nitrite with careful temperature control, we can see that this really dark orange uh, foam forms at the top. This is good because this should be our product. Now we just let it stir for 20 more minutes. So after filtering, I washed with an extremely large amount of water to get rid of all acidic residue and we have our product. So here it is, our C2N10, also known as diazidotetrazine. Um, if you couldn't tell by the molecular formula, this stuff is very unstable, so I have to be very careful when working with it. Naturally, we're gonna first start with the flame tests. Wow. Okay, yeah, this stuff is pretty powerful. So I'm gonna try direct flame on that tiny amount. Yep, just as powerful. Okay, this is scary stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna try the uh, impact sensitivity. Okay, so it's not extreme, as you see. It took a, it took a, you know, a little more force than I thought. But good lord, that stuff is sensitive. So now let's try friction. Okay, so that had a, uh, again, it was not as sensitive as I thought, and that was actually dry. It's just, uh, yeah, still extremely sensitive. Now let's try the 50 milligram can test. I think I can confidently say that this stuff lives up to uh, what I expected. Thank you everybody so much for watching, and I'd also like to give a special thank you to everybody who helped me along the way. It was great. Thank you so much.